right. So we're actually going to get started. Um, as people are jumping on, I um, just want to welcome our so excited he's here today. So um, just to begin, I'm Ruth. I know I've done a couple of these with you all. So thanks for joining us again. Um, we're really, really excited about this one. I love this case and I'm so pumped to talk about it. I especially love because it's a victory and it's all happy and, and David gets to tell us all about that. So I want to jump into that very shortly, real quick. Um, I am here representing the Reform Alliance. We are a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to ensuring all K through 12 students in Arkansas receive a world-class education. Um, today, our topic is going to cover a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, which ruled that parents must be allowed to exercise religious options um, in educational choice programs if states allow for private schools to participate in those programs. Um, and that kind of became a, a thing. And David's going to explain all of that very shortly. But real quick, um, just want to go over a few just housekeeping things um, just to keep us all rolling. Um, if you have any questions, please, please, please comment them in this box on Facebook. We want to answer them. We will try very hard in our short time together to get to all of them. Um, we had some questions that, that were sent in early. Um, and so we will just roll through those very shortly, but please comment. I want to hear your questions and, um, and we certainly want to, um, to answer them. So um, again, here at the Reform Alliance, we have a, a real mission to create a network of parent and community leaders um, so that every policy decision and every conversation about education starts and ends with how it impacts our kids. So today's uh, discussion is perfect for that because it, it shows how such a big case that goes all the way to the Supreme Court can actually benefit and, and, and change the lives um, of students in, uh, in our own backyard. So um, again, our guest, David Hodges, was on the Institute for Justice team that argued this case back in January, and we have been following it, waiting for a decision since that moment. Um, and David's team at Institute for Justice was ultimately successful in, in, in receiving a favorable ruling by the highest court in the land. So again, ask your questions as this is going on. Um, we will have a survey also that will pop in the comment box. And so after this is over, go fill it out and let us know what you think um, and let us know what you learn. But real quick, let me introduce our guest. I'm gonna read his bio and it's um, very impressive. Um, so prior to joining Institute for Justice, David was a director at CN Communications International where he worked with the New, Jer New Jersey governor's office, universities and private companies, to create the nonprofit governor STEM scholars. This leadership program gives promising high school and college students a comprehensive introduction to the state's STEM economy through a series of conferences, field trips, internships, and research projects. Over his tenure, the program tripled in growth, graduating, graduated over 300 students, and enjoyed both statewide and national recognition as a super, super, superlative, why do I put those hard words? I mean, these lawyers, uh, <laughs> program that demonstrated a positive impact on the workforce. David received both his undergraduate and legal degrees from American University, and prior to law school, spent two years as the research assistant for the late Washington Post columnist, Charles Krauthammer. I'm a big fan. Following law school, he worked at the law firm Winston & Strawn. David has been interviewed on PBS and NPR quoted in the New York Times and published in the Atlantic National Journal, Commentary, Star Ledger, Week Weekly Standard, and the Ocean and Coastal Law Journal. Um, and so you've been interviewed by all those people, but I think this is gonna be your favorite one. Um, so thanks for joining us, David. We are honored to have some of your time on this Thursday evening. Um, real quick, just to jump into it, and if I miss anything about, about what you've done through your years um, in this world, I'd love for you to, to, to let us know, but really I, I would love to know how you got involved in this movement. Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here and to, and to join you all and to talk about the Espinosa decision. Um, you know, like I think probably like a lot of people, like I got involved by being, um, you know, a member of my community. You know, growing up in the synagogue that we attended, there were a lot of opportunities for mentorship of like younger kids. And it was something that I benefited from. And it was something that, um, that, that when I grew, up, grew older, um, I also participated in. And when I went off to college, I continued in, in doing mentorships for students that were in underprivileged communities. Um, and helping them study and do tutoring, things like that. 
But really the hinge event for me was when I got a chance to go back to my home state of New Jersey and got, and I received an invitation from a friend um, who was working at one of the charter schools in one of the underserved communities. Um, and I went there for the day and it really opened my eyes to, um, both to, you know, sort of how other people, the, the lives that other people have, their the different educational experiences, but also the really innovative things that charter schools uh, were doing um, to sort of break the public school mode and to provide, you know, other options um, and to not simply uh, accept that one size fits all in education. Um, and so ever, ever since then, I've been, you know, very passionate about educational choice and ensuring that everyone has the educational opportunity that works best for them. Yeah. So you got involved with the Institute for Justice. How long have you been there? I've been at IJ for about a year and a half, but okay. I was a long time fan of IJ. So yeah. I feel like I've, I've been with uh, them for an even longer time. Yeah, I'm sure. So really cool to be able to work for them, I'm sure. And so you you get there a year and a half ago. So you're talking like the beginning of last year, beginning of 2019. And then a year later, you're arguing before the Supreme Court. I mean, did you <laughs> did you imagine that would happen? I mean, what, what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had no idea that that was going to happen. But but you're right. That's that's essentially what happened. I was hired in December 2018, and about a week later, I was taking affidavits um, for um, for the, for some of the people that would end up being in the Espinosa case, um, and. I remember at the time thinking that, you know, this was like a pretty good vehicle for going to the U.S. Supreme Court, but at the same time, anyone who, um, who is an attorney knows that they've really got to be humble about these things because the, the Supreme Court receives something like 7,000 petitions a year and only accepts about 80 of them. So there, it's like a pretty remote chance that your petition is going to be granted. Um, but nonetheless, I knew it was a really important case and, and I knew that it always had the potential. And so when we received word that the Supreme Court granted, um, granted our petition, it was an incredible moment. Yeah, I'm sure, wow, it's very humbling, I'm sure. What, um, explain to, to everyone sort of how this case ultimately got to the Supreme Court. What had to happen, what, you know, what's, what's the issue at hand and just sort of the, the road to, um, to, to y'all's January argument? Sure. Um, well, I mean, really, the origin of the of the case takes us back like kind of like 150 years ago when the Blaine movement was uh, sweeping the country. Um, you know, basically, the the sort of shorthand of it was that the 19th century saw a rise in Catholic immigration, and that time coincided with the development of the common school, which was the predecessor to today's public schools. Um, and basically Catholic immigrants were unhappy and they asked for funds to start their own schools or to simply not have you know, these religiously oriented schools. And basically in response to Catholic concerns about the nature of the schools, a movement arose to consolidate the Protestant monopoly of the schools in the name of quote unquote non-sectarian schooling and sectarian was a code word for Catholic. So it was basically like they wanted to consolidate their existing monopoly and basically exclude the outsiders and these Blaine amendments um, ended up being um, amended to the state constitutions of 37 states and were used um, to great effect to basically impede or invalidate um, educational choice programs. So basically what happened in, in the mid 19th century essentially set the stage for Espinoza. Um, and so basically in, in 2015, I wanna say, um, uh, Montana passed a tax credit scholarship program uh, where basically if someone donated $150 um, to a scholarship granting organization, they received a tax credit. Um, and then the total funds that, that made up, the, that, that, that funded the scholarship um, were dispersed to low income children. Um, and basically what ended up happening was the Montana Supreme Court struck down the program under its Blaine Amendment, essentially saying, um, you know, that the amendment, you know, forbade any kind of aid going to sectarian schools in any way. Um, and as a result, um, the program was unconstitutional. Wow. And so then, you know, it argued, I guess, at the lower court, it goes, it goes from where? From the district court up, basically? Oh, I, I skipped a few stages, but it started, right. off, it started off at the trial court, it went up to the appellate court, and then it went to the Montana Supreme Court, um, which, which struck down the program entirely. 
And then that's what ultimately got it to, uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court. That, exactly. and like you said, uh, just luck of the draw, I, I guess, when, when your case gets picked to be argued. Right. Well, I mean, some of it is luck of the draw. And I think that some of it was also that this was an issue that yeah. interested um, a number of the justices uh, for some time. And, you know, they're always looking for vehicles um, to, um, to, to, to rule on issues of law that are both important to the country as well as important to them. And, you know, it only takes four justices to grant a petition. And there were four interested justices who wanted to learn a little bit more about what happened in Montana. Do you know the four? I, I can speculate, but I don't yeah. know who they are. Yeah. I, I didn't know if that was something they, they, they broadcasted. Um, but no, I guess you just get, you get the green light and you just go, you don't like ask questions, you just roll. Um, so you were hired as an education attorney, right? That's your, your title. I mean, so sort of your day to day when you're not arguing before the Supreme Court, which, you know, I mean, everyone does that. Uh, yeah. When you're not doing that, sort of what is your day to day role? I'm sure it changes every day, but. Yeah, um, well, basically, I would say I have sort of a dual role. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, we, you know, we were in, involved in a number of lawsuits um, and, and basically after Espinoza came down, um, we you know, were looking to put the final nails in the coffin of the state plains. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, I'm involved in different lawsuits, basically defending educational choice programs. Um, and on the other hand, uh, or my, my, the other part of my time rather, is dedicated to working with uh, different uh, state legislators and policymakers to pass uh, educational choice programs. And so do you all have a lot of groups come to you just, I mean, kind of struggling with the same, similar to what Espinoza, the Espinoza case said, I mean, just, you know, people are blocking what they think is rightfully theirs, um, you know, blocking that option. I mean, do, do y'all, do y'all see a lot of that happening across the country? Uh, well, historically that has been the case. Um, but, you know, where we are right now, uh, you know, we're in, we're in the position where, you know, the wind is at our backs because we have this great ruling from the United States Supreme Court saying that these amendments, um, you know, are, have, have more or less been neutralized. Um, and so, you know, for, um, I don't want to say for the first time, but, um, but for probably one of the few times in, in recent history, um, you know, we're able to go to these courts um, and to these legislatures and say, hey, this is not an obstacle, you know, anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. It's, a, it's definitely going to help that argument. Um, so, I, you know, like I mentioned at the Reform Alliance, you know, really our objective is, is finding parents and community leaders who really want to engage in their communities um, to improve their children's schools. So how does this recent decision have a direct impact on them, on communities, on families trying to find better options for their children. I guess, you know, what can you say to, to sort of um, give them a little, just, you know, just to excite them a little bit about what this really means. So I think when these cases come down, we see it in the news, we read about it, and then we kind of move on. But explain to us a little bit more about what it means just to the everyday, everyday person. Sure. Um, so what I'll do is I'll read two quotes from the decision um, that I think kind of encapsulated, then I'll expand a little bit more on it. So in the decision, which was written by Chief Justice Roberts, he, uh, he wrote, a state does not need to subsidize private education, but once a state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. The Constitution condemns discrimination against religious schools and the families whose children attend them. So basically what that means is that in almost every state, um, including in Arkansas, um, there's no longer any obstacle for, for state legislatures to pass school choice programs. But there's no longer any obstacle as far as Blaine is concerned to pass one of these programs. Um, so basically if the state wants to pass uh, a program like this um, where they're benefiting low-income families or, they're, or, they're bet or it's more broad and, and benefits um, you know, people in a certain geographic area or it's statewide, um, this program is going to be open to everyone. And since um, in a lot of states, the majority of private schools are religious or have some sort of religious affiliation, it really expands the number of options that are available um, for students in Arkansas, as well as students um, all across this country. Yeah. 
It's very powerful. We were fired up about it. You know, it was just, it was such a, such a big win. We remember when you guys argued it in January and we kind of were like, let's just see what happens. Um, but what an incredible win. I mean, you guys, congratulations, really. Um, and thank you. Um, so tell me, sort of walk me through the argument, if you can, you know, I mean, of course, arguments, you have very strong opinions on both sides. I know how the Supreme Court works. You get like, what, like a, a minute and a half or two minutes or something to make your case um, before the, the justices. So, I mean, what was sort of y'all's prep, I guess, if you can tell me that, you know, it's, kind of, it's like a game plan, but uh, you don't want to share maybe, but, um, and just what, explain to me y'all's side of the argument. Sure. Um, well, I guess if we're talking about the, you know, the prep, um, you know, this involves an incredible amount of work from, um, from our team. Um, it was really like a full IJ effort. Um, and, you know, from, from our communications team um, to, our, to our fundraisers, to our attorneys, everyone was really involved. Um, but for like the core team of attorneys, uh, it involved a lot of thinking, a lot of writing, a lot of refining questions and refining answers. Um, we did a lot of uh, what are called moots, um, which is where you have the attorney who is arguing uh, basically get peppered with every single kind of question that any of us can think of. Um, and, and the purpose of it is to both sharpen our answers as well as to sort of probe for weaknesses in our argument. Um, and so we must have spent, you know, hundreds of hours doing that, I would say, maybe even, maybe even thousands if you take into account all the time that we just worked on just writing down these answers and then rewriting them and then rewriting them again, or in some, some cases just saying, no, that's a terrible answer, we should just get rid of it. Um, and, you know, we put our attorney who was arguing, a wonderful guy named Dick Comer, um, really through his paces uh, you know, he likened it to being like on the torture rack. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And, you know, but, but it, you know, it ended up paying off. Um, yeah. And, you know, basically when the funny thing was, was that when we actually got to the court, you know, we, we felt like we asked every single conceivable question and, and, and provided every single conceivable answer. Um, and then it was just go time. And, you know, what was, as you mentioned, you know, when the when the when you start when you start arguing before the Supreme Court, you have two minutes that they give you um, that are uninterrupted, um, and then once that two minutes is up, uh, the justices dive right in. And I think in our case, um, it was Justice Ginsburg um, who was asking us a question about standing, um, who was the first, and then we had uh, Justice Kagan and um, and Sotomayor. And I think at the end, there was maybe one question from Alito. So it was a, it was a hot bench from, from several of the justices, um, whereas while the others just sort of kind of kept their cards close to their chest uh, when we were arguing. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask, who, who kind of gave y'all a run for your money, but so all the ladies, right, and Alito. <laughs> Right. Well, Alito, Alito asked us a, a sort of a, a friendly question. Okay. Um, that's, so just it. women. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and you know, it, there were the questions that we expected, um, you know, uh, and they were the questions from the justices we expected to get them from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but we were, but we were prepared. And I think that, I think that we, I think that our attorney parried with them very well. Yeah. Well, it sounds like those thousands of hours in, in prep, you know, probably helped a little bit. So that's, that's why you do it. Right. Um, so I'm looking through kind of some questions, you know, we're, we're getting, that's why I'm, my, my eyes are kind of going side to side. Um, I'm trying to see, I guess this is a good one, you know, in hearing from, from families that reach out to Institute for Justice, what's sort of the biggest roadblock that you see families facing when it comes to education? Is it, is it the options? Is it, I mean, you know, what are, what are you all hearing? Well, I guess that there, are, I mean, I, I think that probably the biggest obstacle in the legislature is, is sometimes just a lack of, um, a lack of uh, political courage to pass one of these, uh, you know, programs. Uh, you know, there are, 
they're they're very entrenched and powerful forces that are against them. And you know, it's up to it's up to organizations like IJ and like and like the Reform Alliance and parents um, and students uh, to show up at these legislatures and to talk to uh, different legislators and to tell them that you need these programs that they that they benefit real people um, and that they make a real difference in people's lives. And you know, there have been you know many times over the years that there have been legislators who have been skeptical or have been oppositional. And you know, they have a parent who comes up to them and says, Hey, you know, your son attends private school, or you know, you're you have choice, you know, why can't I have choice? And it changes their mind. Or, you know, there's just a story where it's like, look, my school, you know, like my school worked for my my public school, my assigned public school worked for my you know first child. Uh, but my second child is having a lot of problems and, you know, it's not working. doesn't mean that's a bad school, um, but it's not working for him. He's getting bullied. He's, he's struggling with learning, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, he needs another option. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, so that's like, that's the biggest obstacle um, getting to these legislators. But I think that once, once we do, um, you know, we're able to change a lot of minds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's why we've seen it. It's just parents are just so incredibly powerful. Um, at, you know, because we always say, and I mean, everyone knows that, you know, parents are the best people to speak for their children. And so we can do what we do and you guys can do what you do, but it's really takes just parents to just be super engaged. And we've been very, very lucky in Arkansas. We have a, a lot of, a lot of parents that are just, will just go out there and, and talk to legislators and, you know, share information and hold events. But I think that's where it sort of begins and ends with, is with, is with those parents really, you know, taking a stand and, and, and accepting that, that the status quo is not good enough when it comes to education um, for their children. And we actually, our guest about a month ago here, we did a same, same thing as what you and I are doing um, uh, is Walter Blanks. And you may be familiar with him. He works for um, American Federation of Children. And he just has an incredible story. And just like what you're talking about, you know, just didn't want to go to school and, and just really wasn't, it, it just wasn't working where he was. Um, and then after changing that environment, I mean, now he's, you know, he sat next to the president in an education meeting. Um, he's now working for AFC that they do so much of this just awesome work um, for children and for options. And, um, and you're right, it just takes people to get engaged. And, and we certainly hope that, that this, this decision will, um, will, will break down any of those walls that, that may have been up before, especially for legislators, for, for folks who are kind of not sure where to go. You know, it, we, we certainly hope that this helps. Um, trying to see what other questions are coming through. Um, let's see here. This is a good one. What, um, and you kind of talked about it that, you know, that you realize how important this is, but what really motivates you? What just makes you just love going to work every day and, and love just fighting this fight? Um, well, I, there are two things really. I mean, the first is that IJ is an incredible place to work. There are a lot of really smart and motivated and passionate people there. Um, it's the best place I've ever worked. And I think that if everyone uh, could work at a place like IJ, um, you know, there would be, no one would be dissatisfied with, uh, <laughs> with where they go to work. Um, and then I think like the other part of it is that, you know, through this job or through any job really, um, you know, there, you know, it can, it can be easy to get cynical about things sometimes, mm -hmm. but, you know, in this job, you meet a lot of people who are just ordinary people like you and me, um, but who are in challenging circumstances and, you know, Maybe they don't, maybe, maybe they're a single mom. Uh, maybe they're a grandparent raising a kid. Uh, maybe they're just two parents that, you know, are working really hard, but just don't have enough money to send their kid to a school that works for them. Um, and you hear these stories and, you know, they're oftentimes they're heartbreaking, um, but, but they're often, you know, quite inspiring as well. I mean, they are people who are doing what they can for their children and for their families. Um, there are people who have, who have ended up in, you know, rough circumstances. And when we go to work, we work for them and we provide options for them. And so, you know, we just, we just set up, we just, we just help defend these programs. And then, you know, these people have, you know, these parents have one less thing to worry about. Um, they can send their kids to school. They can send their kids to a school where they're not being bullied. 
they can send their kids to a school where they're getting a good education, where they're safe, uh, where the teachers love and respect them. Um, and it's something that all, that everyone should have. Um, but when we when when I go to work at IJ, I know that these are the people who we're working for. You know, it's um, it's what we're all right. Um, and you know, and did, did the work with the STEM program and and all. Tell us a little bit about that if you can dive into that because I think I mean we we talk about STEM all the time, so I think our folks would be interested in hearing if you don't right. mind sharing. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, I was hired for this job back in my home state of New Jersey. And it basically, the impetus behind it is that New Jersey has more STEM professionals per capita than any place on earth. Um, yeah, it's actually known as the, um, the medicine chest of the world because of all the pharmaceutical companies that are there. Um, but they're facing, um, or they've been facing uh, this massive talent outflow problem uh, where basically they educate all these people within the state and they have all this critical infrastructure there in, in the universities, uh, in the corporations, in academia, and a huge percentage of the people who they educate end up going elsewhere. Um, so they have like a massive, massive brain drain. Uh, and so basically what the purpose of the program was, was to sort of stop that brain drain a little bit and to get the most talented kids um, from all walks of life uh, and to get them exposure to the different sectors of the state STEM economy uh, through a series of like conferences and research projects and internship opp opportunities. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a really fun, um, it was a really fun thing to do to build it from scratch. Um, and it was great to both see the kids who were from all walks of life, you know, work together and meet one another and meet all these different STEM professionals um, you know, and, and there were people who were everyone from the kind of just, you know, engineers at, at the local power plant to people who were very high up in the pharmaceutical companies to even like historic figures uh, like Morris Tannenbaum, who was the person who, with William Shockley, invented the silicon transistor, um, basically founded Silicon Valley. Um, and so, you know, it was a cool opportunity to, to, to set something up for the home state. Um, as well as to, you know, to create these different opportunities for, uh, for kids who, like kids everywhere, um, aren't quite sure what they want to do with their lives. Right, right. And so that was before, I'm, I'm trying to remember, that was before you went to law school or after? That was after law school. That was after law school. Yeah. So then you shifted into the, the really the, the legal world, I guess, more so. Um, yeah. I mean, was it always your plan to be into the in the education side of things or what, I mean, what, you know, I guess what kind of law did you see yourself practicing? Sure. I mean, I was, I think uh, in law school, you know, so prior to law school, I had worked at the, for Charles Krauthammer at the Post. Um, and, and, and when I went to law school, um, uh, my interests at the time were more sort of international law and national security law. Uh, and so I think I saw myself as more going into like that sort of space. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, over time, your interests change. Um, things that seemed appealing in one respect are less appealing in another. Um, and, you know, education became the thing that was, you know, even more important to me. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's like not, not everything that you, not everything that, um, that, that, that seems so appealing at first is the thing that ends up enduring in its appeal. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that was sort of the case with me with that, with that other stuff. But yeah. education and working with these students and kids is something that, um, you know, that I think I've, I've always had a passion for. Yeah. No, that passion is, is very, very obvious. Tell us a little bit more about Institute for Justice itself. What is, what is it? Like, give us the, give us the elevator pitch. <laughs> well, IJ is an incredibly cool place that does amazing work, um, you know, defending people's civil liberties. Uh, and so basically, you know, we work in, in, in several areas, you know, defending free speech, property rights, educational choice, and you know, more recently, kind of like government accountability. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, that's been in the news a lot is after the George Floyd protests is this whole concept of qualified immunity. Um, and so like, that's like another, you know, area where, you know, we're working to help defend, you know, ordinary people, 
um, you know, who are just trying to, you know, you know, live with their liberties and have them defended. Um, and we step in to, you know, to defend them, to defend their right to get um, a good education, their right to protect their property, um, to speak freely, um, and to be free from government abuse. Wow, that's a lot. I'm sure you all stay yeah. busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's too bad that we're so busy, but in another way, it's great that we're really busy. Right, right. No, that's, that's amazing. Are there a lot of groups you all work with? I mean, besides, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're mostly on the legal side, you know, I'm, I'm sure other, maybe other firms, but, um, but I mean, are there any other groups like education groups y'all, y'all do a lot of things with? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're willing to work with anyone um, who, has, who shares the same goals as us. Um, you know, so, you know, we'll work with Excel and Ed and Ed Choice, um, you know, and AFC, you know, all those, all those groups. And, yeah. you know, and if the, if the unions ever want to work with us, we'll be happy to work with them too. Yeah, for sure. That's how we all feel. As long as we're all moving forward to, to getting better options for the kids, that's, um, I think we'll, we'll work with anybody. Um, yeah. and we, we certainly appreciate what y'all have done. I mean, we, again, when, when the case came down, um, it was interesting just trying to localize it. And, and that's why I was asking the question earlier, of like, how does this impact our neighbors and our friends, you know, and here in Arkansas, I mean, we have several different education options to choose from, but, but of course we run into the same, sort of the same issues as, as any other state of just, you know, if, if, if a child's in the, uh, the wrong zip code or done, you know, the family doesn't make enough money to maybe send them, send them to a certain school, why should the child have to then stay in a school where they're not excelling? Um, or were that maybe not even just not excelling, but not being challenged enough. I mean, I think, you know, we had a, a, a wonderful mother here in Arkansas who wrote a, a letter to the editor. It was, it was in our paper about a month ago. And that's what she was just saying. Her child was young little boy. He was like, I think like six or seven years old, first, second grade. Um, and he was just always in trouble. And she started realizing she's, he wasn't a bad child. He just wasn't challenged enough. And so I think that's something that gets forgotten a lot. Um, it's certainly something we see and, and you all probably do too. It's, it's not that the child is bad or has even necessarily has a learning disability. It may just be that they're not challenged enough. And so it is, it's the first step to success. Giving a child a good education is just setting them up for success. Um, now, of course, what, you know, what people do with that is, is up to them as an individual, but, um, but we certainly feel like it's, it's something worth investing in and something worth investing our time in. Um, and we know you all, you all share that as well. Um, what am I missing? What did I miss about the case? What, what do you want to tell the folks of Arkansas? The floor is yours. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I mean, all I can say is that this, this case is a major landmark case. Um, you know, it, it effectively neutralizes the Blaine amendments um, in 37 state constitutions. And it basically makes all forms of educational choice available in 44 states, um, some forms of it available in four states, and, and doesn't really affect it too much one way or the other in two other states. Um, and so this is a big moment. It's a big moment for education. It's a big moment for families, uh, for students. Um, and you know it's up to us uh, to capitalize on this moment and to talk to our representatives and legislators and to share our stories um, and we encourage them to pass programs that, that benefit people from all walks of life, um, that have been empirically proven to work, um, and that are just simply the right thing to do. Um, and it's up to us to take advantage of this. And I hope that, you know, people who are watching this, um, you know, will, will, will join us. Yeah, no, it's a great call to action. And, and we certainly saw the folks of Arkansas um, get really excited over this decision. We had our attorney general, we had our lieutenant governor um, make very bold, uh, positive statements. And um, everyone's just really excited about the opportunities that this will give us. Um, so we appreciate you. We appreciate your team at IJ. Um, we were part of a little video. I don't know if you got to see it, but that we sent, you know, just thanking you all for, for what you did. Um, if you didn't, I'll, I'll shoot it to you. But, um, yeah. But it was just, uh, but it was just, I mean, I think it, it, it showed, I mean, it was, just, it was groups from all over the country. Um, just thanking you guys, because really y'all are making, um, making our job a little easier. We still have a lot of challenges and we still have a lot of roadblocks and we still have a lot of hoops to jump through. But I mean, that's life. And I think in, in this, you know, in this time with this pandemic, um, it, it's really a, it's sort of a neat opportunity 
um, to, to, and I hate even saying that, but it, it really is almost a blessing in disguise because I think education is just going to change um, and I believe it's going to change for the better. Um, so, and groups like yours certainly help, help that happen. So, um, so thanks for joining us. I know it's, it's a little later where you are. And so I appreciate you um, taking time away from, from your family and from um, your, your life to, to, join, uh, to join us for a little bit. So thank you so much, David. It's been an honor to get to talk to you and we'd love to have you come down to Arkansas whenever, whenever you can. I'd love to come. It was my yeah. pleasure. Come thank you very down. much. Maybe football season. If we have one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And thanks everyone for joining us. Again, if you have any questions that weren't answered, please write them in the comment box. We'll be posting this survey. Um, it's, it's in the comment box now. We'll post it once this is all over on social media. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, shoot them to us and I will track David down and I know he'll answer them for you. And, um, and, and again, follow us on social media, check out our website, the reform alliance.org, um, IJ's website as well. We, um, will post all those links on our, on our social media page. Um, they have some great write-ups about this case. Um, I know the press release when, when the victory happened as well as just some, some good background information and you can just go read all about David and what a great attorney he is and you know, all that good stuff. So in case you didn't get enough. Um, so th thank y'all for joining us, David. Thanks again. And y'all have a good night.